Grand-rising, my friends. Welcome back. Good to see you again. Know you're doing great. If you're new here, hola. We are going to get in. We have a lot to discuss. Not that much time. I say that and I continue to ramble. So I am going to just show. Look how much ETH is burning. Wow, wow, wow. Wow, wow, wow. Almost three quarters of a... Well, I'm not even looking at that. 220,000 Ethereum has been burnt. 300 in the last hour. Maybe it kind of like clicks on hours or something. I don't know. Interesting. I don't know how the hour the, the, those amounts are going down. Unless it's just considered each hour. Oh, okay. There's a block going. So it speeds up and slows down. C cyclical. But yeah, ETH is burning. The market. Yeah, Ethereum is doing well. Uh, still just button head up to, to 4K. But now it's at $3,902. Bitcoin. The. Um, Dominance of Ethereum went down as well. So if you imagine a pie and Bitcoin's market cap, Ethereum's market cap versus everybody else, the dominance is how much the total market versus the market cap. So the total market is at 2.36 trillion now. And Bitcoin, you see, is at 0.989 trillion. So it's 41.9% dominance. And Ethereum is at 19.4. It was at 20% yesterday. So it's coming down a little bit in its dominance. Now, that could be a number of factors. Money tends to flow in Bitcoin. You see Bitcoin is going up while some of the other are not. Well, except for Solana. Solana is killing. Dollar. I said a dollar. 168.76 now. Up 50% in the last week. 20% overnight. This is we we're seeing you know, so is it alt season? This is a whole story. We're not gonna go into that right now. I would just say the market is doing well. Knowing where you can get in is a smart thing, especially if you're thinking long term. Like everyone here should be thinking long term could be relative in your sense, but five to ten year span. Your boy went down a rabbit hole the past couple of hours, twenty four hours, y'all. We will get to it. Um. So let's jump into it. Well, because we're here, you know, we're about that positivity. And I'm not even going to go into one of them today because we, <laughs> we got some things to discuss. So if it's someone you admire, please write something nice about them down in the comment section. Forward them this video. Tell them to check it out. See what you wrote about them. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sweet thought. Um, let me see where I want to put this in at. It's going to get heavy near the end, so... Maybe we'll go through a little bit of that. Then I'll just do what I want to talk about. Um, I hate to keep you out on the on wait, but that way, so we will end on a good note. How much B, How much Bitcoin would you get if every single person got an equal share of Bitcoin? The answer is point. If everybody in the world, 21 million Bitcoin, about 7.8 billion people, that's 0 0.0027 Bitcoin. If you have more than that, that is about... The amount that each person, if they got some Bitcoin right now, would have. Of course, that would never happen because a bunch of it's lost. 20 to we saw some numbers a week or so ago saying maybe up there consider like close to 30 percent is lost. And a lot of people have more than their fair share of point zero zero two seven Bitcoin. So at some point we'll talk about how much is a good amount to. And I'll just tell you now, I mean, look. Some say 0 0.001 is a good amount to half. So that's even less than what each person would get a fair share just because of how much has been lost and how much has been central, not centralized, but consolidating individuals and organizations who want it more, you know, greedy out here. Um, so 0 0.001 is not bad. 0 0.01 is better. And if you got 0.1, oh, you doing really well. Because the number used to say like 0.27 was you'll be rich in the 1% if you have 0.27 Bitcoin. 
Uh, then it was down, but if you counted the loss, it was 0.18. Point, yeah, 0.18. Um, so, something to think about. As you collect and just, I mean, that's a thing. You, want, you don't want to be too greedy. There's a lot of greedy people out here. You just want to get your fair share and enough to where you can, you know, make sure you can take care of the people you love and your family for a couple of generations. Is that too much to ask? Is that too much to ask? I don't believe so. So, yeah, but, you know, they're here saying, look, The number of the people in the world with access to the Internet is only at 4.66 billion. So the vast majority, they were saying that it is never, you know, they say like Bitcoin could solve the problems in Afghanistan. Oh, what, what the problems? Oh, were there, what's happening with the Taliban and what they're doing, the, the, how they view uh, what you consider women's rights? Oh, yeah, Bitcoin would solve that problem. Yeah. <laughs> You know, half the people in the world don't even have access to the internet. Half the people in the world don't have smartphones. Not that they can't, and we're not, and it won't be a ramping up of those technologies to all parts of the world. But some people may not even want it. You know, for whatever reason, you got to be mindful. You can't just put what you want on everything. That doesn't work well to go around and, and force everyone to agree with how you think the world should be. From my understanding and, and, and study of history, that doesn't seem to work out too well for individuals. I won't say what I first thought when I read about these two people, but, you know, it's a good thing. And they are smiling and happy in service. But maybe we should talk to them about how this ain't this ain't <laughs> the most helpful thing for individuals. Hold on. They saying Bitcoin up to 52.6 honey. I want to see if that's. Oh, yeah. OK, I got that. there as well. Oh, yeah. OK. The market is going up a little bit. Cardano been down today. I can tell you, I will talk about how I know that intimately in a little bit. A father and son who help clients find forgotten crypto passwords estimate billions of dollars worth of lost Bitcoin is recoverable. I'm like, hey, maybe some things are better left lost. <laughs> yeah, man. I'm not, yeah, you know. So these two guys, it's a long, you know, long and short of it. This dad and his son, uh, the dad was a computer programmer in his 50s, said, you know what, I saw the stories of the people losing it. I think we can figure out how to help these people get it back. And what they do is sit down with people and do detective work, basically, which is, hey, how do you make up passwords? And then from there, they try to figure out how to get into these wallets. For Chris and Charlie Brooks finding lost passwords to cryptocurrency wallets require figuring out how their clients' minds work. And that effort can help their customers retrieve a slice of what the pair estimates to be about. And you show how to get to the calculation of almost $5 billion worth of recoverable. And we'll, I'll get, that, get down to that to show you how they got to that calculation. So out of the people they saw... It was 70. So they went on a site, a forum, filtered it out to people who had lost money, more than I think half of Bitcoin, found 72 posts. And for reading these posts, they estimated, determined that 14 are potentially recoverable. And from that on work and recovering wallets for clients, they can decrypt about 35 percent of passwords. That led to the conclusion that about 2.5 percent of lost Bitcoin is retrievable with a range between. Six sixty-eight thousand ninety-two, almost ninety-three thousand Bitcoin, and you know this. And the reason I'm not reading this article because the author is Bitcoins with an S, and there was you know no point to be yelling today. We're gonna get, be very excited about the things we're reading about. So that's what they're doing. Hey, they help somebody get about a quarter of a, um, almost like four Bitcoins now, five Bitcoin now quarter of a million out of a wallet as little as some people just a couple hundred dollars you know just a couple couple thousands at this point a bitcoin or hundreds a couple hundreds maybe so you know hey I'm not gonna say uh, don't want them that good luck but I, yeah i'm not gonna say good luck either in a movie <laughs> I mean, feel like a hater like that. Like, hey, look, the less Bitcoin mean the other people who have Bitcoin here is more valuable. But that's just being greedy. You don't be too greedy. 
Bitcoin miners and oil and gas, speaking of greedy, oil and gas executives mingled at a secretive meetup in Houston. Here's what they talked about. Long and short of it, this is what's going If you didn't know about this, this will blow your mind. That if you're drilling for oil and come across natural gas and not prepared to get that natural gas, which oil you can put into a tanker, natural gas has to go into a pipeline. If you don't have a pipeline built, you're somewhere way out and not you know, set up for gas at that time, then gas just fuses and is dangerous. So they either let it just vent out one method is to vent it, which releases methane directly into the air, a poor choice for the environment as its greenhouse effects, blah, blah, blah. And we know that are much be stronger than carbon dioxide is horrible. We know that a more environmentally friendly option is to flare it, which is actually lighting the gas on fire. Chemistry is amazing. We understand it because the product of the combustion of methane with fi via fire is carbon dioxide and water and carbon dioxide is less harmful than Methane, you know, instead of shooting you, I stab you once, and you know, depending on where at, both could be very big problems. But you know, theoretically, if you had to choose one, long story short, they're able to take those methane that they're finding when they're drilling for oil, and instead of flaring it out, burning it, or just releasing, letting it just vent out, they can run generators which run Bitcoin miners, and so these people are meeting up. These oil executives, because they understand that times are a changing and electric vehicles are the future. Electric, the electrification of our systems of transportation and that will cut down on the use of hydrocarbons. And we will always need it, but... It would be much different than it was as the the grease that ran the literally the oil that ran the engine. Now we have just the juice that runs the batteries that runs the motors. Yeah, basically. So the oil executives are looking at how they can, and it, you know, it makes sense. It's not it it, it now is this considered green? energy for bitcoin it was going to be wasted anyway it was going to be created in waste anyway but now it's being used in a way to at least take other demand off the the network that's questions you have to ask yourself south african regulator comes for binance binance is in some trouble i didn't know cz was talking about he was going to step down i was talking about cz on several occasions i said he's ready to step down as ceo preferably for a regulatory professional to help the exchange get in the good books of regulator regulators globally the regulators are beating down binance they yeah this is what you see when the governments attack you you make you, you give yourself a face and the person to attack that's why bitcoin you know if bitcoin had a board of directors and <laughs> Imagine if Bitcoin had a central office and someone that could be brought in front of Congress. Oh. They have raided people who they thought was Satoshi Nakamoto, like literal police raids on individuals who they just, you know, made mistakes and just thought it could be. So let alone if it was real. But South Africa is the newest in the line, the latest country to crack down on the number one crypto exchange, Binance. In a statement issued, the country's financial sector conduct authority warned South Africans against having anything to do with the crypto exchange. FSCA warned against locals accessing services as crypto exchange through a telegram group. Really? It may have been faked if it was a telegram group. South Africa warned that crypto investments are not regulated in the country, reminding investors of the risk. If something goes wrong, you're unlikely to get your money back and will have no recourse against anyone. Oh, man, because, you know, they love to protect you, to keep you safe. I'm not even just going to honor that. We're just going to move past that. We will see what happens with Binance once they just start paying off all the bullies. But look at this. This is a rendering, of course, of a Tesla next to this urban electric vertical takeoff and landing. 
VTOL, EVTOL, the Leo Coupe is a sci-fi flying car with a 250 mile top speed. This thing, it looks beautiful. And that's a concept, of course. But they actually, you know, we'll go jump down here. Company has... Blah, blah, blah. Company has also designed a Vertiport named the Stop where potential parking woes eliminate. Urban ETV, EVTOLs is going full strength with aiming to have a demonstrator in 2022. We'll see. It's a year away. It would also apply for FAA certification and sell the aircraft as a partially built kit. Urban EVTOL said that the price for each vehicle will be in the range of $300,000 US, US buckaroos. So now this is dope. For anybody who's not looking at screen, I'm sorry, but I'll describe it, but looking at screen is, is, is pretty. So they show the interior of the car. It looks like a, I would say, is 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 automotive shape. Um, can fit in a garage, a little bit bigger print in the car, but low to the ground, but wide with fans on both sides. I'm not gonna describe all of it, but if you, now we're looking at it, it has like golf wing. I guess if you say that in the Tesla, golf wing doors. So the doors open, is one like a pilot seat that's in the front that's hovering above a glass bottom. And not when I say it's hovering, it's attached from the ceiling into the front. And on the back of the pilot seat, there is a like a display, almost like a big giant screen on the one they showing it shows like a map, but under it is glass or clear. And then his back seat with two look like you can see two, possibly two and a, a child, but probably just be two people in the pilot. So three people, I think that's what they said in the article as well. Three, yeah, three passenger seating capacity, maximum speed of 250 miles, range of 300 miles, flight time of one hour and 15 minutes with reserves, 16 ducted fans, for vertical takeoff and landing flight, six ducted fans for forward flight along with box wing configuration. And these are all things, the design element you see on other companies. This is a lot of companies, and we'll talk about this as well, who are working on vertical and takeoff landing ETOLs or EVTOS. Uh, e EVTOL, VTOL, VTOL. We'll come up with a better name for that. Air taxis, flying cars. The United States has an Agile Prime, if I'm not mistaken, which is the United States Air Force and Marine are looking at making these vehicles and working with the FAA to really speed up and ramp up production of getting everything, you know, uh, rushed through the system. This was about a year or so ago, and I'll look it up and bring it up another time. Talk about Agile Prime. I think that's the name. Agile Prime is a cooperation between the FAA, the United States Air Force, and the Marines, I want to say, and they are going to, they call it, they call these things ORBS, um, was it, I forget the, what the acronym of ORBS stood for, but they call them ORBS, they're going to be flying through the air, what does that sound like to y'all? <laughs> I'll show you, hey, like I said, none, if you don't believe what I say, go look it up for yourself, but this car looks dope. We've been waiting for this. But no, I was saying, so these design features you see on a lot of other companies like Ilium, I know they have these boxed duct fans for their vehicles. So interesting. Last story. Well, before we get into some other things, we'll be, like I said, it's kind of deep. I was talking about intergenerational trauma. So not going to, you'll see there's a lot of, um, some of it has to take a bit of speculation land, even in the in the scientific community. And so it's OK to recognize when you have theories and you want you're working to see if those theories are correct versus what we do know for certain when and the word certain is relative. So we'll talk about how some things we can look and, and make sense. But, you know, we we'll still will have to do the research to be certain. OK. Intergenerational trauma is a theory that trauma can be inherited because there are genetic changes in a person's DNA. The changes from trauma do not damage the gene causing genetic change. Instead, they alter its function. Epigenetic changes. The way of it thinking of this. Simple terms. That you inherit genes from your mom and your dad. OK. And so which one. And so you get copies of everything. So which one you 
express the meaning the one that is encoding you and runs you know the one that your body works and runs can depend on different factors we don't really know understand this process too well but you know we understand that somehow it happens some of it we understand is this which is epigenetic factors which is depending on how attractive each segment is is if it gets ran and coded as the dna that runs in the body versus out of the copies that it has so individuals can have impaired copies and good copies and sometimes will run an impaired copy because it tricks the system to thinking it's better. Other, most times the body recognize and looks for the better copy that it wants to run, right? For the most part. So epigenetics is understanding how, the <clears throat> best way to think of it, I tell people is, you know, we always talk about nature and nurture. Now we understand how nature impacts, I'm sorry, nurture impacts nature in the sense that you can be born with your genes predisposed to certain conditions and based on the environment you're in it can make sure those bad things happen or it can help uh, or it can help uh, or the, the, the environment can protect against those bad things if that makes sense so we didn't understand that for, you know, I remember when I was a long time ago, we didn't understand epigenetics. We thought the DNA you got was the D, you know, was it, it stayed stagnant it was or static. It didn't change. Now we understand like, oh, it can, your D, our DNA, how we express it can change. You know, yeah, you may have genetic damage from like radiation or exposure to certain substances, but and that can cause damage to your D damage to your DNA and then you know disordered expression. But we didn't know that certain conditions can change the way you know what I mean by conditions. And you know, being in prison, being abused, uh, being uh, going through starvation, how those stresses on the body can change the way your genes are expressed. And even we think it can change what you pass down to your children. That's basically what epigenetics is that we didn't know that that could occur like that in the sense that you can your dna can change not or change how it's expressed and then that gets pushed to it force or not it, it's not it's not forced it influences you know as opposed to it you know it, and it's going to be influenced in any in some way but it can influence heavily what's passed on and how your children respond to stress, uh, stress, basically, stress of the system. At the end of the day, that think of it as simply as that, you know, a, a argument, a death, war, everything is just stress to the system and how you respond at the, at the most fundamental level of trying to understand what I'm talking about here. Epigenetics is the study of the effects that environment and behavior have on genes. Researchers found an association bet between prenatal exposure to famine and an offspring's later adult disease risk. The offspring in the study had less DNA methylation, a biological process that controls how genes are expressed of the imprinted IGF-2, insulin-like growth factor 2 gene. So in that one, they thought that the because the adults were exposed to famine, their kids were smaller in size to almost adapt to the less food. See, some of it, like I said, it goes to speculation. Can we be 100% about that? We're not. But it makes sense. It sounds good, right? But you got to be careful about what sounds good in this world. So what, why people get so angry about a lot of this is because a lot of the research came from... Um, Jewish individuals researching the effects of the Holocaust on the survivors and their children. And so some individuals, just because it was based on that, fought <laughs> the information. And so I remember years ago, an individual came, I was at a place, an individual came to talk about this, and people were protesting that individual. Or, you know, it was a big thing, like, wow, this... It, and it was only based on that. This, I, I think they're lying because I don't want to believe that. So it is what it is. You got to be careful with that. More than careful of, of not being able to accept that maybe time 
gives us better clarity on what happened in the past and we can learn from it and become better people as opposed to want to live in uh, fantasy lands. So that's where a lot of it is was fucking on how trauma, epigenetics and trauma. But I think we talked a little bit about it um, so that you can understand of how trauma and this is just something about trauma affects people and stuff. And then they're trying to sell something to you. But it's interesting to think about. Could this be could this explain why why certain individuals seem to repeat patterns, you know, um, in my life, I see a lot of people when they start to tell the story of their life in a way that, you know, is a little bit more organized in the way most individuals kind of see and think they need to tell a story. You can start to see the patterns of, oh, yeah, I, I had children at a very early age and then my children had children at a very early age. And there's a conflict between me and my fam, my parents. And then it's conflict between me and my children. And they not really seeing like, oh, wow, I'm doing the exact same thing that uh, that my family did and stuff. It's interesting. But all right. So what was it that I was blibbering, blabbering about earlier? Since I last saw you, your boy went a little bit nuts with the NFTs of just learning and getting deeper and deeper into this space. So OpenSea is a good place for Ethereum and Polygon NFTs, OpenSea.io, or, and then for Cardano, which is new because remember Cardano is barely just starting their NFT and smart contracts. So a lot of this is the wild west and no telling where it may be in the future, but C nft.io is where cardano has some nfts so let's look at OpenSea. you go to marketplace here and let's look at all nfts so you guys have heard of loot we talked about loot the other day let's let's go in here and look up loot that's what we talked about yesterday so these loots are going for 20 eth I know this is loot for cyberpunks. We're looking for loot. I don't think it's loot for cyberpunks. I think it's just loot for adventurers. There we go. That's what we want for adventurers. The floor price, meaning the lowest price that you will find most of these for is 12.1 ETH, which to right now is how much is that right now? Uh, 12.1 ETH would be almost about 4,000. So, you know, getting close to 50K. 50K for the lowest one right now. And what we're going to do is buy now, which ones are for sale. And you can see this is what sale that... For <laughs> it's just it's insane, right? Loot for adventures. Loot is randomized adventure gear generating store. So there were seven thousand, seven point eight thousand, seven thousand eight hundred made. There are twenty six hundred, twenty six, yeah, twenty six hundred owners. Wow. Let's look at another one. Uh, everyone was talking about crypto punks. Floor price, it don't even have a floor price. I don't even know if any of them for sale. Any buy now? 125 ETH. Oh, please. This ain't for sale for 54. I don't think none of these are for sale. They just have a, they're not for sale. <laughs> they're just here. Is any of them are for sale on auction? So these crypto products are ridiculous. But a good site, oh, what was I, it was a, we'll look it up. But so anyway, go to here, Marketplace. Easy way to go about it is let's go for new. And some of these are a little risque. Here are these gambling apes. Oh, yeah, let's, let's look that one up. The Board Ape Yacht Club. Board Ape. Okay, the floor price of these, <laughs> 41, almost 42 ETH 
to buy one of these. You can put a bid in for 32, for 32 for these. Let's see, buy now. Anybody selling theirs? Yep, you can buy one for 41 ETH right now. I'm gonna buy you a board ape. For about um, 160, 160K in American money right now. But the ones over here, let's look at some interesting ones over on Cardano. They're a little bit better yet. So the big ones here on Cardano, and I'll show you here. This Cardano NFT trade volume, you go over here to top projects. So Space Buds has been the number one of all time and in the last week as well. Crypto Dino, Cardano Trees, Unsigned Algorithms, Coco Loco. So let's go back and now look for any of those. Space Buds are going for 50,000. 50,000? How much is that right now? That's about three. This is say about three. So that's about 150. Okay. I don't think all of them are that expensive. That's a little bit insane. Car uh, Cardano Bits, I think, is doing well, too, if I'm not mistaken. But I think one of these cool ones right here, yeah, these Cardano trees are pretty cool, man. Like, this is like, you look here, it's a tree. This one is in Russia. It doesn't have any fruit or flowers, but it's a, it has day, night, rain, and snow. So it's a living art exhibit that grows on a Cardano chain. And that's what a lot of these things are turning into. And we'll talk about that, that these are becoming collections that people are looking to build up into the the, met, the metaverse. And if you know what the metaverse is, imagine a artificial world that's living and breathing that lives in parallel like we're starting to make our own parallel dimensions <laughs> and realities and so we're making up you know this parallel reality where it would be existing on a cardano or ethereum blockchain all the time and the nfts you buy exist in that world swords or weapons or or paintings or trees exist in that world and So it's either make money off of it or just see that the future is going to, you know, be a much stranger place than I think any of us ever imagined. So for, most probably go here to new. There was one supposed to look for upcoming. Um, these entities. OK, I guess they, a lot of people come up with that. But you want to look for the blue check marks. That means it's somewhat verified in the sense that they we'll, we'll just look at this one. Gambling Apes Club. So the floor of this one is 0.2 Ethereum, which is probably about what? Uh, like 800 bucks now, 800 or so. And when you click on them, I think was it? They talk about the background. No. Uh, it was one where they would tell you, like, about, like, the community and stuff. Sold out in seven minutes. Wow. So, something to think about, but it was interesting, and I've been going down a rabbit hole. With that said, I love you. You love yourself. God loves us. And that's all that matters.